Well, I'm back again talking about genetically modified foods. Uh, don't ask me why I'm doing another video on this topic. It's not very entertaining to me at all. Uh, but I was looking through some stuff and I found a, a blog on Huffington Post uh, by uh, Maria Rodale. I might be mispronouncing her name. Um, where she had a guest blogger, a Ernesto Gonzalez, the CEO and founder of Gust Organics, a organic restaurant in New York City, um, and he was her the guest blogger on on this this HuffPo article called Twelve Reasons to Avoid Genetically Modified Foods," and I thought, well, twelve reasons again. I'm always looking for that kind of you know the the uh, leprechaun gold at the end of the rainbow kind of a thing. You know, I figure if somebody's going to list, you know, here's my top 10 things, here's my top 12 things, that they better be pretty convincing, right? Because you're not going to use your crappiest, you're not going to use your 12 crappiest arguments. You're going to use the best ones you can find, the absolute rock solid, most convincing things, right? Um, so I, I took a look at it and it's, it's not that great, to be honest, no disrespect, Mr. Gonzalez. Um, but it's not, the list simply isn't that great. However, unfortunately, it's more than typical of the kind of stuff. And I want, I think it, it, I'm going to use it as a good example. Okay. Um, now he has a kind of a, a bit of an introduction as to why he compiled this list and why he was writing this blog. Um, and I, but I think I'm going to deal with the introduction at the end. Okay. Um, I'm going to do a little bit backwards. I want to go through his 12 points. Um, the one nice thing that, you know, to give him a thumbs up for is that for each claim, he has a reference, um, a linked reference, uh, where you can, you know, you can hypertext click on the reference. And again, all of this will be down below. So I'm going to get started here. All right, here's a warning. Uh, you're going to see a recurring response to a number of his 12 points, okay? Just warning you ahead of time, and this is one of them. Uh, so um, he states that GM crops use a lot of toxic chemicals in their production, um, and those toxic chemicals can have human health risks, okay? Um, and then he points to an article. Uh, he has a link to an article uh, on some organic farm thing about the president, some presidential report that... Um, herbicides and pesticides um, collectively um, are not really good for you. And I don't think anybody disputes that fact. Nobody's suggesting that these pesticides are good for, are good for anybody. Um, they're not, you know, it's a matter of what degree, of course, obviously. Uh, but this is the recurring theme. What does that have to do with GM crops? Uh, I'd really like to know. What, what does that have to do with them? Why are they targeted in this then? Um, your 12 points against specifically against genetically modified transgenic crops. Uh, do you know that the vast majority of agriculture, no matter what they're growing worldwide, uses pesticides, uses chemicals um, in their production? Uh, there's no GM does not use any more or less. Well, okay, well, there, there's there's a slight difference with that with the uh, uh, glyphosate, but that's that's if you're not using that, then you're using another toxic chemical. You, it, it's, it's, you know, you got to look at it that way. Um, so in, in essence, your point number or his point number one is a reason to buy strictly organic food as opposed to non-organic food it has nothing to do with genetic modification. Okay, we're back to this again, uh, if you guys watched my last video. So research has shown all of this damage caused by feeding animals in laboratories this GM crops. Now this is, I, I'm, this is often said, this is, this is, I don't know if there's a term, I'm sure there is a term for it and I don't know what it is. Uh, I look at it almost like incestuous citations or I don't know, what do you want, what do you want to call it? You'll see something, you'll see, I'll say Jeffrey Smith will say, in an article, in a HuffPo blog, he'll say that, uh, you know, and hundreds of studies show this damage occurs. And then he'll have a link. You click on the link and it links to another 
HuffPo article by Jeffrey Smith where he makes the same claim. You click on the link on that article and it goes to some other anti-GM or pro-organic food person citing Jeffrey Smith saying that same thing. But you never get to the actual articles. Where are the... It, if indeed this research exists, where is it published? Now, I'm, I'm not saying that there's not published articles on the subject uh, and, and a lot of non-published or anecdotal articles, but the actual specific ones where they discuss the damage caused, the actual liver damage, the actual fur growing in the mouth of hamsters, the, the loss of fertility, the um, aborted offspring, all of these you know horrifying things that the anti-GM people bring up, the studies for those as far as I can determine, are non-existent. Uh, where they exist at all, they are unpublished. Uh, they're articles that are, if the word published works at all, um, as in presented before anti-GMO conferences. Uh, they're uh, emails received, and I, I, I know this isn't about Jeff, um, but Jeffrey and I saw one of his blogs, he actually, or one of his talks, he actually had the nerve um, to cite as evidence a series of emails he got. And this farmer in India reported in an email to him, that kind of a thing, as scientific evidence. But the actual studies, these studies, if you're going to say research shows, the term research shows in a scientific context means that there is a clear peer-reviewed study that has that result, um, that result with with a replicates, uh, with you know a probability, these kinds of things done with that, and it doesn't exist. Sorry for going on about it, but that really irritates me, and I keep seeing that same claim. And again, just like with the other incestuous claims, like Jeffrey Smith has made, um, he links to an article that then cites the same makes just makes the claim again. Um, and I suspect if I followed the links. I would ultimately end up back where I started from. Okay, I don't know if uh, Mr. Gonzalez is being dishonest or didn't read the article he cited or what, or maybe he just looked for a conclusion he wanted and called that good. I don't, I don't know what the case is, uh, because the he has an article. Um, he links to an article, an anti-GM article, of course, uh, which doesn't mean it's bad. But this article um, has has a number of tables and figures in there, and reports that there was in two thousand and eight a twenty six percent increase in the amount of herbicides. Uh, used on on GM crops. Now this you think, okay, that's 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 a lot, right? That's what that's what he said. Except for Mr. Gonzalez says per acre. In other words, two thousand and seven they used a hundred pounds I'm saying that per acre. And in two thousand and eight they used hundred and twenty six pounds or I I don't I'm not gonna you hope you get what I'm saying. That's what he's saying. That's what he claims in this. When in reality, what they're talking about is they're showing the increase in number of pesticides, herbicides used on GM crops in the United States. The total amounts, right? Does that make sense? Uh, which, oddly enough, coincides with the increasing amount of GM crops grown in the United States. Do you see what I'm saying here? Um so you start off in 1997 when there was less than 3% of U.S. acreage was GM crops and you go to 2008 when there's 60 plus percent of acres of the United States farmland planted with GM crops. And guess what? There's a corresponding increase in the number of pesticides used on GM crops because there's more of them. Okay? This isn't some increase in the number. It, it doesn't, it's not even in the anti-GM report that you're citing, or he's citing here, okay? I hope that makes sense. Again, links down below. I'm sorry, but no, they're not, okay? GM crops are not in, 
increasing the need for stronger pesticides. Increased use of pesticides is responsible for the need for stronger pesticides. This is an unfortunate consequence of agriculture. Okay, you can say, okay, because we have Roundup ready soybeans, we're putting more Roundup on them, therefore causing the weeds to become Roundup resistant, necessitating a stronger herbicide to kill the new weeds. Yes, that, that all makes sense. But if the soybeans were not Roundup resistant, we'd be using another herbicide. Okay, Does that, and then we would have weeds resistant to that one, and we would need a stronger herbicide. Evolution happens. It's an unfortunate thing um, that the side effect of this bacterial resistance, this pesticide insect resistance to the things we're designing to kill them. It's it happens, and you but you can't blame GM crops for it. All right, same answer as before. No, it's not, okay? GM crops are not causing the evolution of super weeds. Our increased use of pesticides, our increased use of herbicides, insecticides are causing the targets of those products, the things they're meant to kill, to adapt. It's evolution, okay? We're, we're creating a new selective pressure Nature is responding to that selective pressure, okay? Um, it's true. Uh, we have Roundup-resistant crops. We're likely to use more Roundup on those crops. That's, I'm not going to argue that point. But if we weren't using that, we would be using something else. And the insects or the herbs, the, the weeds, would be growing resistant to that. It, do you see? Um, even your organic farms, they have to use something to control the pests, okay? And I'm going to get to that in a bit uh, when we get to uh, this BT stuff. But for right now, okay, just, just kind of under, hopefully my point is clear. This is not unique to G genetically modified crops. Um, it's a, it's an, something happening with all of human agriculture. And it's something that's been happening with human agriculture for thousands of years, uh, in varying, with varying selective pressures. Well, I hope that makes sense. Um, but the one, one thing I wanted to get to now, now this has nothing to do with the list exactly. It has to do with this point in particular, um, but it doesn't really have to do with the list. This just came up as, an, as one of my asides. Uh, now I have several chapters. I don't, I haven't read the whole book of um, the world according to Monsanto. I'll put a link down below. Uh, now this book, there's also, a, I guess, a documentary. I haven't seen the documentary, but it, the thing that made me laugh about it is that the the, the author now this, this it has to do with this claim directly, um, but in the beginning chapters of or be, of the world according to Monsanto, the author spends a great deal of time trying to convince us, the reader, that this transgenics is this new, unimaginably twisted bastardization, raping of Mother Nature. That we're taking these genomes, ripping them open, stuffing these new genes in, sewing them back up, and hoping they survive, and not caring what the products and you know, I mean, she goes. It's very, very graphic. A lot of um, like Jeffrey Smith has used a lot of uh, sort of almost rape-sounding terminology to describe how this is done, with an emphasis on the fact that these products could never have evolved. You know, that this would never happen in nature. This could this kind of resistance could never exist you know a, a lot you know what the point of it being is that she's trying to counter the claim that this is just an offshoot of you know this is just the same thing we've been doing with, for millennia with crops in terms of selective breeding except now now it's targeted and more efficient we can actually insert the genes we want instead of selectively breeding them over over generations she wants to distance those claims from each other and say that this is something new and horrifying and you know whatever okay if that makes sense but then in a few chapters later she talks about the same problem she talks about and you know that this you know weeds have evolved resistance to this and this and that and apparently not noticing the contradiction not seeing that so this resistance to to glyphosates could never evolve in nature. It's just, you know, this, it's this, it's, it's a, you know, it, this just proves how evil 
what evil uh, mad scientists you know have done creating this chimera this monster that could never exist in nature you know isn't that horrible and then now that you've forgotten that a few chapters later isn't it horrible look what's evolved in nature this roundup resistant weeds have naturally evolved without our help uh, hopefully somebody else finds the 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 hip hop the comparison the the i don't know the disconnect to be amusing Again, this has nothing to do with transgenic, genetically modified crops. The vast majority of the world's agriculture relies on synthetic nitrogen fertilizers, whether or not those crops are genetically modified, okay? We use a lot... Okay, does it cause increased greenhouse gases? Yeah, it probably does. But you know what? What are you gonna, What's the alternative? You're going to compost? You think composting how much fertilizer would it take to fertilize all of the world's agricultural areas to feed seven billion people through composting what kind of gases is that going to release you do realize that organic fertilizers you know which are animal products uh, composted plant products and such release a lot of gas heavy volume they tend to leach into water systems a lot faster, causing eutrophications of lakes. They're actually more harmful to the environment than these synthetic fertilizers are. Now, this may work fine on a small organic farm, but we're talking about vast regions of the world dedicated to agriculture. We simply can't use um, organic fertilizers for that. And it's, again, I, why you, you attribute this to GM crops doesn't make a bit of sense to me. Okay, I think that this is a legitimate concern. Um, I do, you know, that's a very good point. Um, I think that it is important, however, when you're looking at a study, I read the entire study, that we not overstate the conclusions of the, that the authors are making. Um, the authors did not conclude that 50% of our food supply is contaminated with these uh, genetically modified genes. Uh, that's kind of these trans genes. What they concluded was is that there have been some crossover and that 50% in the samples that they looked at. Um, now, that this does suggest that there may be a wider spread of cross-contamination going on. That's certainly, it's a valid point. Um, but the authors conclude that, first of all, they never found any actual, none of the genes that they found they didn't find complete genes. They found fragments of, they found sequence fragments, um, non-expressive sequence fragments, primarily of the promoter sequence. Um, the, um, the, what is it? The tobacco mosaic virus promoter sequence. That's what they found the majority. That was by far their, their overwhelming, meaning the sequence that puts the gene into the plant in the first place, if that makes sense. Uh, that that's some and, and that's not insignificant. I'm not saying that that's not a problem, um, but the authors also conclude that this doesn't represent a risk to any health or safety. That's something that's kind of missed here, um, meaning that these non-GM crops that had these genes were not producing the toxins. Um, they weren't producing the these these things in the first place. But they say even if they were, that's not really a problem. What, they, what the authors conclude, however, is that this should be a red flag, this should be a warning that we, do, we need to recognize that this occurs and we need to, in the future, take it into account. Especially, now this is what the authors stress, um, in, while it's not currently ongoing, uh, and that wasn't what they were looking at, uh, but the idea that we could grow a crop to produce a particular, say, a medicine. Let's say you want to, I'm, I'm just making some, making stuff up here, but let's say you want to grow an onion that produces insulin that can then be refined to produce insulin. You don't want 
insulin producing onions to make it into the food supply you don't want you see, you don't want people buying an onion off their grocery store shelf and having a high dose of insulin in it i, I don't even know that that would have an effect i don't know i'm not don't get into the details of my example um and the same thing with vaccines the same thing with uh, other pharmaceutical products of these crops and so the authors are saying that once and this is it's it's a, a huge open feature fu future in biotech is this production of you know pharmaceuticals we don't want those genes cross cross contaminating into um, our crops and that I think that's a very valid concern and they state that because of their results of their study that the FDA the USDA need to be strengthen the regulatory mechanism the things in place to prevent this from happening so um again valid study but you got to be really really careful about what conclusions you draw from it again be careful when you're uh looking at literature make sure that there's not you know what that literature you're citing actually states first of all and then also look for follow-ups uh you're citing or the citation is from the lossy et al paper in nature i believe uh that found that indeed pollen from bt corn fed to monarch butterfly larva caused higher mortality rates that's absolutely true this was a laboratory experiment now this is critically important um if you would have looked oh however um researched a little bit uh less than two years later less than a year later actually a uh, follow-up paper by sears et al in 2001 11 years ago by the way uh actually followed up on that study with a real risk assessment okay meaning a combination of laboratory studies and um actually looking at what the real risk is and they made several conclusions first of all uh, they're they're just sort of spoiler the end result of it was they said the risk to monarch butterflies is extremely low uh, for a number of reasons one is the fact that the uh the actual pollen event the, when the pollen would ever be in the wild in the field spread to milkweed plants which these caterpillars feed on um only occurs during a very very narrow window okay okay that's something that's really important so it's not like now that in a laboratory you can save pollen and you can dust it any time during you know you can when they hatch out of the little eggs you can dust it with pollen and see what happens to them however in the real world the pollen is not present when they're hatching out of their eggs it's not present throughout most of their larval cycle it's only present during a small part of their larval cycle that's one point they made uh the second thing that they concluded was that the actual amounts of pollen used in the experimental in the laboratory study was orders of magnitude more than ever observed they actually went to fields and they actually took milkweeds and they looked at how much pollen is deposited on milkweeds and now it, and i'm not i'm not trying to in any way degrade the quality of the lossy et al study this that was a, it's a very valid study um it's very typical of laboratory experiments um those kinds of experiments are important to give us a something to then launch from for further studies so they found it in the fields first of all very very little milkweed in actually adjacent to these crops uh proportional i mean there, there simply isn't that much there compared to milkweeds nearby they found that less than five meters away from these bt corn plantings um there was virtually no pollen whatsoever um that's kind of important as well so in the actual bt corn thing milkweed growing there had pollen on it significantly less than in the experiment but had pollen on it um, enough pollen that it could potentially have caused some adverse effects however as soon as you move away from that field no pollen okay that's something important the other thing they concluded is is that the um i, I don't recall the name of the crystalline the, the actual ingested molecule um that this corn produces that that kills larva um it which is the point of it um they found that the significant amounts of it were in the anthers um meaning it wasn't blown in the pollen it was actually in the anthers the experimenters took corn anthers and then dusted the pollen from that 
which resulted in significantly more of the toxin making it, the specific toxin making it onto the milkweed leaves in the experiment versus what they would ever encounter in the real world when the pollen grains themselves are blown off. The pollen grains themselves contain very low levels. So that was important too. Um, and their conclusion was is that simply looking at the expanses of milkweed and where that milkweed occurs simply is not going to intersect with these corn plantings in any kind of level to make any kind of monarch mortality significant. So I just, that's kind of important. It's important to follow up when you, when you see a study that concludes some harmful effect, you can look at typically there'll be a flurry of responses to it. And those responses um, may either support the study um, may validate it, may say that yes, this is a concern, and here's even more reasons why it's a concern, or they may invalidate it. They may show that the experiment was poorly conducted, which wasn't the case in this case, or they may state that um, while in a laboratory setting, the results are significant, in the real world, they're not significant, okay? And that's what the Sears et al. 2001 paper showed. Again, link down below to a full text of, of the Sears report, of the Sears paper. Um, the other thing, though, the I, and this really kind of doesn't make any sense to me. I think you're just searching for articles that you think may support your your case. Uh, these uh, neonicotinoids um, being implicated in bee population die-offs. Um, now that's a big thing. You know, lots of you know co bee colonies are suffering um, extinction. And it's a big problem, and there's been a lot of speculation as to what's causing it and all this kind of stuff. Um, and one of the possible causes of it are the these pesticides, these neonicotinoid um, insecticides. However, this has nothing to do with GM whatsoever. Um, it Again, it's back to your same point again. Um, it may be a reason to support organic farming, but it still has nothing to do with um, with your with your uh, with GM crops whatsoever. There's, it's not like GM crops are producing neonicotinoids or anything like that. This has there's there's it's just an irrelevant point. All right, Mr. Gonzalez, here you cross a line. Here you go from being potentially misinformed, uh, maybe not able to understand the literature or something. Here you've crossed a line into outright dishonesty. This is dishonest. You take a sentence, um, you take a fragment of a sentence from this report and claim that it's with the conclusion of the report, which is not the case. Okay, you're, you're okay. Let me, let me get into this. You say that GM crops do not increase the yield from that. If you read, how does that sentence start? What, what's the beginning of that sentence? Is it GM crops? Is that the beginning of the sentence? Or is it state currently available GM crops? Now, if you read the full report, which I suspect, well, I'm assuming you did since you're, you're citing from it, since you went through it enough detail to cherry pick a sentence fragment that's called quote mining um it's 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 a uh, well let's just say it's one of my uh peeves it's something that irritates me beyond very very few things in this world irritate me more than dishonest quote mining and there you've done it in this case uh, if you read the report it talks about the traits available in gm crops um, herbicide resistance, production of insecticides, drought resistance, uh, increased yield as specific traits in the crops. It states that specifically in the United States, yield increases is not one of the traits available. Meaning in the United States, we currently do not have GM crops that are specifically designed for increased yield. We have crops designed to mainly for herbicide resistance and production of insecticides. If you, that same sentence that you quote goes on to say that increased yield, however, results from less loss of yield to insects, for example. 
do you see the, the point? So you've got corn that produces an insecticide. That corn plant, if you take that corn plant, here's one plant, here's another corn plant that's not GM. And say they both produce four ears of corn. If you weigh the corn, it's exactly the same weight. There's no increase in yield of that corn. However, in the non-GM crop, say 10% of it, the, of the kernels have been eaten by worms, by caterpillars, right? You have less yield when compared to the GM plant, right? Even though the plant, the actual specific trait of the plant is not increased yield, which is what the sentence that you took out of context is saying. And I, I know you had to have known. I mean, this is not, this isn't like reading a complex scientific paper and trying to, you know, figure out what exactly they mean. This isn't something where ignorance of the terminology comes into play. This is very, very, very much the same thing as the creationist quote mining. This is taking, in this case, a portion of a sentence and saying that, you know, for example, this USD report claims, you're making it as a claim. That is really, really dishonest. And I, it, unfor it, I've been sort of treating this as giving you the benefit of the doubt, saying maybe you just, you know, maybe you're drawing conclusions from people who are misinforming you, you're being lied to, or maybe in the case where you're looking at the literature, you're not understanding the complexities of what they're saying, you're not understanding the conclusions of the authors. In this case, you're lying. You're outright lying about what that paper says. Um, you should be ashamed of yourself. I'm not sure I understand what the concern is here. Um, you know, I mean, I, I, I understand that, that, yes, there's a sort of a more or less of a monopoly. Um, a very small number of biotech companies control the vast majority of genetically bioengineered foodstuffs. Um, I can see that as a problem. But in your case, I'm not sure why you see it as a problem. Um, so 95% of the seeds are controlled by one company Monsanto. I know you don't say Monsanto, but that's what you're referring to. Uh, so if I get it, if I'm understanding what you're saying here, um, would, would you feel more comfortable if 20 different companies provided the seeds that you won't plant or don't want to plant? I mean, you don't want these, right? You don't want GM seeds. You, you're, you support organic farming that wouldn't purchase these GM seeds, regardless of who was supplying them. It wouldn't matter if a hundred companies were potentially supplying them, right? You're still not going to plant them. So what difference does it make if one, two, three, ten companies control the majority of this product that you don't wish, you don't serve in your restaurant, you don't want farmers to grow in the first place? Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Okay, I've got a few points about this. Um, this is, okay, regardless of your opinion of patenting genetic products, patenting of things like seeds, uh, whatever your opinion of that, whether for or against it, I don't, in, I'm not sure how this is a problem with genetic engineering or transgenic crops. Um, you know, this patenting of seeds, this uh, making it illegal to replant seed products didn't start with, with uh, GM foods, didn't start with these new things. Um, this would kind of be the equivalent of saying that, uh, you know, a particular copy protection on DVD was the start of copyright protection. You know, you see what, where I'm saying, what I'm saying? The, um, in Europe, after World War I, the first laws were enacted to protect because there was a, a whole advance in agrotechnology that produced seeds, but produced crops um, that various companies who invested in the research wished, wanted to patent, wanted to uh, protect from, you know, what's the point of spending money to develop something that a farmer can then just keep replanting and never have to buy from you again was sort of the idea behind it. Um, 
it, it started in 1930s in the United States, the first seed laws were passed that prevented, that made it illegal to replant certain varieties. Um, and I, anyway, the point being, this isn't, this isn't something that's unique to GM. Uh, traditional cr crops bred through traditional methods uh, or also protected under these same laws and under the same thing, the same regulations. It's not like new things went into effect with this GM crops. Now, GM crops, I guess they make it easier, I would guess, um, simply because you can do a analysis, you can do a genetic analysis and prove that a farmer is growing a crop that they didn't purchase. So I s suppose sort of like a watermark on a digital image that it kind of is, provides a way of, of proving it a lot easier than with a crop that's say a, a hybrid that's produced through traditional breeding techniques um but it, the laws in place are, are not are not unique so i'm not entirely sure but this kind of this, i'm going to sort of go off on one of my asides as i always do on this because um, i think this and this relates back to the hybridization there was a point made earlier about um these you know genetic contamination and such as well and i think that there's a there's a relationship between this uh, because of the fact that, you know, a few people have commented to me about uh, being opposed to Monsanto, for example, the patent they have on Terminator seeds, which are not, in they're not utilizing, um, aren't being currently used, which means essentially you buy a, say you're buying a, a strain of BT corn to plant that will never produce viable seeds. So you have to buy for the next year's crop, you have to buy again, right? That's, you know, that's the point of it. So the seeds are sterile. The plants are sterile. They can't, which one, one advantage of this is that it prevents hybridization. These, these can't hybridize with wild crops as easily at least. So that's, that's kind of one advantage to them. And that's, that's something that I see a lot of the anti GM people kind of rally against, you know, look at this horrible thing they're doing, right? Look at this, look how horrible that is. They're, producing seeds that won't germinate. So farmers can't, well, essentially break existing law and replant. Um, so instead, they, again, reinforce and actually go out and um, since that technology is not being used in the United States, uh, they are then in order to enforce these laws, they, they, you know, because I'm sure in some cases people are breaking the law. They are saying, you know, screw you, Monsanto. I'm going to replant this. Um, why, why should I buy from you again when I can just keep replanting? I'm sure it goes on to some extent. I don't know. Any, I don't have any numbers on that. But I'm sure it happens simply because it's human nature. Um, but what this kind of brings up to me, kind of a sort of a, a weird thing, is that the anti-GM people are sort of rallying about these Terminator seeds. You know, what a terrible thing these are. How horrible this Terminator technology is. Um, but I was kind of thinking of it. Uh, if at the same time, you're also, they're also saying a big flaw, which, you know, what about contamination? You know, what if these things breed into the, you know, hopefully that makes sense. Um, so it's, it, if Monsanto had, say, chosen the terminator route with these seeds then people would people could you know protest and go all, all up in arms because you know monsanto's making these things sterile they can't reproduce they can't hybridize and you know this is terrible you know how controlling manipulative um but if they make them non-sterile then people say Oh my God! These can spread into the wild. Look, this could—you know—these could go feral. These could hybridize with existing varieties of, of non-GM crops. These can hybridize with wild varieties of, of you know where where the wild variety uh, populations are adjacent to the the farmed ones. And you, so they're kind of damned no matter what they do, which I guess is the point of it because the anti-GM people they simply don't want these to exist at all. Um, but anyway, the point being, I guess, I'm sorry, I'm my little ramble there. The point is, is that uh, seed laws, whether or not, I mean, I, I, I see arguments for and against them. I'm, I'm not going to take a side on, on, the, on seed laws, on the protection of intellectual property as it applies to a biological product, however it's produced. Um, but the point is, is that it, the operative word is that however it's produced, whether through um, transgenics or through traditional breeding, the laws are in place. Uh, 
and you can try to change the laws if you wish, but it's not specific to GM crops. Now, I don't know how to respond to this. I, I'm not entirely sure. So, you're saying that GM is bad because it's part of a system of industrialization, globalization, um, that is bad, so therefore it should be stopped. I, I hope you see the flaw with that argument. Um, if, let's just say, by tomorrow, worldwide, everybody agrees, worldwide, we're going to eliminate all GM, all transgenic crops worldwide will be destroyed, will be you know, the seeds will be burned. They'll never be produced again. The technology is now illegal. Okay? Isn't going to change the fact that massive industrial farming worldwide is going to keep increasing. It's not going to affect that. Um, and and whether or not you think that's a good thing or a bad thing is, is irrelevant. Uh, there's a problem. The problem is... There's 7 billion humans on this planet. Uh, the 7 billion, and some of the estimates I've seen projected to be approaching 10 billion in the next 40-something years. Uh, that's a problem. That's a huge problem. These people have to eat. People have to... And it's, it's really, really nice um, that in... Somewhere in the United States, you know, somebody can have an organic farm, a few acres or even a larger organic farm, and their local community can buy organic vegetables and all of this kind of, you know, that, that and that, you know, they can compost and they can grow this. And I think that's a great thing. I'm not opposed to that. I don't, I don't have any problem with that at all. In fact, if I had the option, I would certainly buy from such a place. But the majority of the planet's people don't have that option, Okay. There are vast parts of the world where people are starving to death. Um, I, I believe if I, I again, I'm not. I have to look up the numbers and don't don't, don't worry about. The, it doesn't matter if I'm off on the numbers; they're still big. But I believe one of the estimates I saw was twenty percent of the world's population is malnourished um, to some extent, um, and some severely malnourished. A billion people over a billion people on this planet don't have adequate food go to bed hungry every single day that's a problem that's a huge problem and if industrialized farming can feed them as sad as it is that some small family farm has to be plowed under to do that i have to say you know the needs of the many I hope you, I mean, and it's unfortunate. Um, it would be wonderful if the whole world could be sustained on small, organic, family-run farms. That would be, you know, a wonderful situation. And maybe someday, if we figure out how to cap this world population growth, if we can, again, everybody hates reduction, population reduction, and I don't mean through genocide i mean you know if everybody on the planet had adequate resources adequate education to reduce their reproduction you know we could start a population decline over decades you know that maybe maybe we could envision a future a sustainable future where we could organically where we could through small farms feed this population but that's not now all right, this video has gone on way too long. I apologize, uh, but I do want to go uh, just a couple of small points about the introduction, Mr. Gonzalez's introduction here. Uh, I think it's important to say. So in the introduction, uh, Gonzalez goes through a his sort of his reasoning. What you know? Why why is he concerned about GM foods? You know the history of his involvement with them. Um, and he writes the following bit. Many years ago, I started reading studies about GMOs, and I discovered that most of the outcomes of the studies favored whoever was financing the research, which in most cases was the agrochemical companies. Okay, Mr. Gonzalez, I hope you understand what a very, very offensive little line that is. 
What you're saying there is that the overwhelming majority of scientific papers published that show that GM food is safe for human consumption, um, we can safely dismiss all of those papers because the scientists who publish them are all lying and saying what their funding sources wanted to hear. Uh, I do please think about what enough blanketing a huge number of really good scientists smearing their names. Um, it's pretty libelous. Uh, it's not even that that conclusion isn't in the paper that you cite there, by the way, the paper says no such thing. Uh, you're in, I don't, I'm not convinced that you read the paper or if you read the paper that you understood what the paper was saying. Um, I think what you did is you found a paper title that sounds like it supports what you wanted to hear or what you wanted to say and cited it as in, as if being in agreement with you. Uh, it, it, that, that I, I, that was, it was pretty bad. I hope I, again, I hope you can see why, uh, as a scientist, you know, how, what a terrible thing to say that is. Now, I'm not saying that science is, you know, completely free of bias. We try, okay? Um, and there have been scientific corruption. There has been cases of, um, you know, b bad science being done, science done, to support a bias that happens it unfortunately continues to happen i'm not i'm not in any way disagreeing that that occurs but methods are in place to at least limit that and these methods work whether you're talking about evolution whether you're talking about uh, climate change whether you're talking about gm crops the scientists the labs that write these papers they conduct a study they write the paper they can be biased. Of course they can be biased. Um, hopefully their study design is such that bias is at least eliminated in, you know, in the analysis of their results and their conclusions. Um, but even if not, the paper then goes to peer review. Once it goes to peer review, scientists not connected to the lab by design, not connected to their funding source, not connected to the lab that produced the paper those scientists go through in minute detail and look for bias is one of the significant things that they look for. Now, again, it's not a foolproof system. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that it is. Um, but it's not as simple as Monsanto pays this lab, you know, or funded a project with this lab. So therefore, the scientists have to lie about the results. It's like, oh, cr all of the rats died in the study. Well, let's say they didn't, you know because that's what Monsanto wants to hear. And then it just, from that point on, it goes from the lab directly into nature or some other journal. That's not how the system works. Um, I hope you can under, I hope you see that. Um, again, and I'm not saying that it's, the system is foolproof. Okay. Don't, don't take that from it. Um, and certainly there is a problem. The paper that you cite was looking at Sources of, potent, of potential bias in these based on funding. This is something they were saying, you know, here's a bunch of papers. Here's who funded the papers that we were able to identify. Um, here's their conclusions. You know, here's a source of potential bias while claiming directly that they were not perceiving bias in the papers that they looked at. Okay. They were merely stating that, you know, we've got a large number of anti-GM groups funding research and pro-GM groups funding research, we need to be careful about how those results, you know, look, We knowing the source of the funding might be an important thing for reviewers to know. That's what the paper concluded. Now, I'm not even sure I agree with the paper entirely anyways. Um, there's a couple of problems I, I saw with it. Um, they didn't consider all possible conclusions in their analysis of published papers. The most important being, what if GM crops are 100% safe? They, you know, that's something that's that they did not consider. But anyway, all right. The final thing regarding this issue before I quit here um, is 
Back to that same statement, many years ago I started reading studies about GMOs and I discovered that most of the outcomes of the studies favored whoever was financing the research. Um, look, let's just, just for fun, looking at that statement, uh, many years ago, so what you're saying there is that many years ago you approached the GM question with an unbiased, open mind and then discovered that well, look at this. Most of the research is funded by, uh, you know, agro companies and whatever. Okay, that, that's kind of what you're saying there. But the paper you cite uh, was published less than a year ago. Um, you didn't read that paper many years ago. That wasn't what tilted your decision to be anti-GM, is it? Um, I, I think to make it more accurate, you might want to think about you know, rewording that statement rather than saying many years ago, this kind of thing. You might want to say sort of like this. Many years ago, I arrived at the conclusion that GM food was dangerous. I then set out to find information to confirm my pre-existing bias. How does that sound? It's probably a little bit better. Uh, you probably could throw in something about how when you were asked to write this blog, um, recently you decided to do a Google search until you found a journal title that, you know, supported your idea that all of this research was fraudulent or something like that, you know. Anyway, okay, that's it, guys. Uh, I will talk to you later. I apologize for the length of this.